Hello, and welcome to another installment of Unraveling Religion. I am your host, Joel Lessies, and it is my uh, honor to welcome Phil Borges to the program today. Oh, thank you, Joel. Thanks for having me on. I, I wanted to just ask you, begin, Phil, by uh, sort of introduce yourself and, and sort of like who you are and, and what you do. So my name is Phil Borges. I'm a documentary photographer and filmmaker. I'm currently making a feature-length documentary that we've titled Crazy Wise, and it takes a cultural look at how their mental distress is defined and treated in different cultures. So that's what I'm doing right now, but I've uh, spent years, um, 25 to be exact, uh, in the indigenous and tribal communities around the world, documenting uh, issues that these people face, usually their human rights issues. And um, I spent five of those years just focusing on the individuals that we call shaman. They go by different names in different communities, but they're people that go into non-ordinary states of consciousness to act as healers or seers for their community. I, I was wondering what brought you to this work for, for you? What was your what was your segue into this? Okay. And, and before I answer that, Joel, I'll just say the number of people that are emailing us every week just since we've had our trailer out there we just made this little trailer for kickstarter and just since we've had that out there we must get six to ten emails a week saying i had my break 10 years ago this would happen this is what i wish would would have happened um uh, and i want to tell my story yeah. so um just by putting that one story out there of this young man named adam um is in inspired so many people to want to put their story out. And I think that's the way this thing will change. But back to your question. So it first happened um, 20 years ago, and I was doing a book on Tibet. And mainly it was a human rights story of the issues happening in Tibet. And I was in the little town of Dharamsala, India, where the Dalai Lama now lives in exile, along with about 80,000 other Tibetan refugees. And I was invited to go into this small monastery that's right next to his residence called the Nechung Monastery and watch this young man, he was 30 years old, a uh, young monk, go into trance. And in our terminology, channel the state oracle, which is a disembodied spirit um, called the Nechung Oracle. So this young monk, which they call the Kutin, mm -hmm. and that's the Tibetan word for the physical being who can act like a medium and channel the spirit. So anyway, I, I watched him go into trance, and uh, it was quite a spectacle in terms of the whole scene. It was a little monastery. Maybe there were 50 monks inside, and they all started beating their drums and um, chanting. And he sat back in this chair. He had this big robe on, and they put this big ceremonial hat on his head. And his eyes kind of rolled back, and his face got red, and he started shaking a bit. And he started talking in a very kind of a high-pitched voice. And the monks gathered around him and wrote down everything he said. And that went on for about, oh, five to ten minutes. And then he kind of slumped uh, in his chair, and they had to help him out of the room, almost carry him out of the room. And I just kind of sat there. I was one of two Westerners in that was that had been invited in. I just kind of sat there with my mouth open watching this. So two days after that happened, I was uh, invited to sit in on an interview with him. And one of the questions that we asked is, how did you become the Kutin? You know, did you go to Kutin school? <laughs> how did this come about? And he said, well, I was hearing voices, and I was feeling very anxietous. In fact, at 
one point I thought I was dying. I didn't know what was happening. My consciousness was shifting. And he actually felt these electrical currents going through his body. And he said, an older monk took me aside and told me I was gifted. And he taught me how to handle this state, how to go in and out of it. And that's how I became the Kutin. So I, I just kind of tucked that away in the back of my mind and went about my work doing this book and exhibit that I did. The book was called Tibetan Portrait. And again, it was quite a political book. It was about the Chinese invasion of Tibet and the occupation thereafter. And I did that project. And two years later, I was doing another project for Amnesty International in northern Kenya. And I was out photographing and I had my guide with me in, and I was in the Samburu territory of northern Kenya, the Samburu tribe. My guide turned to me and he said, you know, these people that we're meeting, and we were just meeting people randomly to do their portraits and tell their stories. He said, these people are told, telling me that the predictor, their predictor, had told them that you were coming. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think too much of that because obviously I was there. Mm -hmm. Anybody could see that. Um, so she went on to just, uh, they described what I looked like. And of course, they could do that because I was standing right there. But they also described my assistant, which was kind of is interesting. She was from Los Angeles. She had, before she left on the trip, long blonde hair. And they had described her as having long white hair. And but before she left, she had cut her hair and put henna in her hair. So she had shorter sort of auburn hair when she showed up or almost red. And so we thought that was kind of interesting. And then they went on to say, you know, this happened after several people. Another person would say, you know, they they told us that you would hide from us when you took their photo. And I. When I'm using one of my cameras, and I hadn't even taken this camera out because it was a new camera for me and I hadn't started using it. It was a view camera and to, and I had to put this cloth completely over my head and I'm inside hiding behind the camera. <laughs> so, you know, that got our attention. And so we finally meet this predictor and she was a woman about 35 years old. Her name was Sakulin. And she had the same story as the, mm -hmm. as the Putin. Yeah. Um, only she had, was, was actually seeing visions, yeah. um, having fainting spells. She was very, very nervous, she said, very frightened and t almost terrified. And a grandmother took her aside and told her that she had this gift. Mm. The grandmother was her mentor and, and helped her through it. So after that, I, I started um, looking up these people in these tribes and in these indigenous communities I would go into and actually asking, who are your healers? Who are your clairvoyants? Um, or who are your priests? And every community I went into had one, two, sometimes four, five, up to ten of these people in their communities. Mm. And uh, so I, I spent five years interviewing these people and, and specifically going around the world, finding them and doing an interview. And one of my questions was, how did you get into this and all but yeah I must have interviewed 45 or more of these people and just a handful maybe four or five um, did not have the story uh, most of them had the story sure. of having these what we would call a psychotic break in their late teens early 20s yeah. sometimes in their adult late adolescence then I, I kind of 
The last shaman I interviewed, I interviewed in uh, 2001. Uh-huh. And it was over in Pakistan. I had uh-huh. heard there was a young shaman being initiated in a group called the Kalash. And that, it's a group that's right on the Afghan Pakistan border. That group is an animistic group. They, they're, they're surrounded by Islam, but they hang on to their very animistic roots and um, believe in nature spirits, and, and they have shamans. So I get there, and I find the shaman, and it turned out he wasn't a young man. He was 60 years old. Uh, we had to walk way up in the mountain. I took my son with me, and we walked way up in the mountain to find him. And he was a goat herder, and and his job was very, very difficult because there's a lot of snow leopards up in that area. And snow leopards are among the smartest animals on Earth. I mean, to keep your flock away from snow leopards would be a full-time job. And that was his job, but he was also a shaman, and he had the same story. Mm. So um, anyway, I came back from that trip, and I had an exhibit down on Lower Broadway in New York, and I went to that exhibit. That was September 9th that opened, and I flew home the next day, and that was September 10th. Then September 11th, 2001 happened, Uh. and I kind of, at that point, thought, you know, what am I going to do with this shaman project? I, I mean, it's interesting that they all had this similar story and how they came into it. And, and I had some uh, interesting anecdotes, but I, I just kind of shelved that project and went on to do other things. It was about two and a half years ago. Uh, that I decided to do a film on meditation. And I teamed up with a, an old friend of mine who is very spiritually oriented, and she has a lot of friends that meditate. And I said, well, let me just, you know, I'm doing all these other projects in different parts of the world on women's issues. But when I get back into town here, can you line up a couple of people that um, are meditators, and we'll just start interviewing them. So the first three people I interviewed, two of them had had a psychotic break. Oh, wow. They were 1920, and um, both had gotten tremendous relief from doing the uh, meditation, and that's when I met this young man, Adam, Hmm. and that's when this project began, telling you how I got into this. I'm so glad that you you give a full full picture and background and contact context, Phil, because uh, I've actually you know I've watched many of the trailers and followed much of your work, and I know Adam through the work that you've you've posted, and uh, he seems a very tender-hearted and, and special individual. Yeah, he is. He's very sensitive, and that's usually who um, who has these issues. Who when. Um, they, uh, when something happens in their life, who knows what triggers it, but um, they tend to be the more artistic, um, they tend to have that side of them. Those are the ones that usually, that usually can get into trouble with, with these breaks, especially yeah. the way they're defined and the way they're treated here in our culture. You mean just straight diagnosis? You mean diagnosis, diagnosed as... Yeah, the diagnosis is a problem because it usually ends up putting a very stigmatizing label on the person. You're in that very vulnerable state of where you're essentially leaving consensus reality. And, and when that happens, it's terrifying. And so uh, what you say is really interesting to me. And one of the things is uh, with women empowered, I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that because it's really fascinating to me. Well, yeah, um, and it was a very practical project in terms of um, the message I wanted to put out there. So, you know, as I said, I've been working in the developing world for 25 years. I've been traveling to it for almost 35. 
And um, one of the things I first noticed early on is how much work women do. Yeah. Not only yeah. the women, but the young girls. And, um, and how much discrimination they face. Uh, young girls typically, uh, if, there has to, if a choice has to be made in terms of who goes to school and who doesn't. So anyway, the young girls carry the firewood, they carry the water. Sometimes carrying the water can be an all-day project if yeah. the well is several miles away. Um, they take care of the, their siblings almost as soon as a girl um, can walk. She's taking care of a younger sibling. She has, a, and consequently, the family needs that for their survival. So those those young girls typically don't go to school. There's a lot of other issues. Uh, women die in childbirth needlessly all over the planet and in remote areas. And it's usually because they bleed out after delivery. And that can literally be stopped in 90% of the cases or even more with a 40 cent pill called misoprostol. Mm -hmm. which contracts the uterus and, and stops the bleeding. So women don't have access to health care. The other thing about women is they produce half the world's food but they only own about 1% of the farmland. Their access to resources is much more limited. Only 17% of the women in the world are legislators. In other words, the people who make all the decisions, only 17% of them are women. Mm -hmm. In the United States, it's only 17 or 18%. Um, violence against women is huge. It's huge here, it's huge all over the world. In fact, many of the people that are coming forward to us and telling their story have been abused sexually as young as children. Because all of the stress and uh, kind of like uh, lack of support or forced to be put in situations of like exerting great effort to care for your family, these stressors, if you have the right combination or wrong combination, if you want to call it, of genetics, and these stresses without the support tie into exactly what Crazy Wise is. Yeah, um, that stress, I mean, where I saw the stress the heaviest was in Afghanistan, and I was documenting the school program there. I was there in 2005. And so what happened when the Taliban took over is they fired all the women, and the women made up 70% of the school teachers, like 50% of the health care workers, 50% of the civil servants. And the other thing about that, when these women lost their jobs, it not only devastated the educational community, it uh, also, many of these women, uh, a large portion of them were widows because their men have been fighting for 25 years. And uh, so all of a sudden, a woman with a family, no means of support, no social network, a safety net, no social security or anything like that, um, were, were just having to fend for themselves. And they'd have to pull their kids out of school. Yeah, and they were under great stress. And, and, and actually, if we could take this in, into a different gear for a minute and just talk about from the human condition, the human perspective collectively for people that, you know, in, in tying this into our emotions, just any individual's emotions, that uh, there is a range, obviously, but like they serve us, right? I mean, emotions serve us to, to, to give us boundary, to tell us how we feel, what is working for us, what does not. And when we begin to quell that or stifle it or enhance it in ways that are chemical, that are not really organic, uh, you're getting into a whole other set of problems. Well, I, I, I have to agree, Joel. I mean, I'm not an expert in pharmacology, I'm going to say, but I'll tell you this, that I've interviewed several psychologists, especially the psychologists we refer to as transpersonal yeah. psychologists, Stan Groff and they look at, they, the way they explain it, they say the psyche itself, like the human body, is self-healing. Yeah, yeah. If 
given a safe container. How could it not be, Phil? You know, I mean, how could yeah, it not be? Yeah, so it, it, the analogy they use is, you know, if you break your arm, yeah, you have to go to the doctor and he'll put something around it, that uh, a cast that'll hold it in place. But what's doing the healing? It's the intelligence of the body. Exactly. Yeah. It's the doctor doing the healing. The doctor is providing this safe container, right. quote unquote. Right. And it's the same with um, a mental break. Uh, that psyche is looking to integrate something that's new, or something that's come across that it, it, it's having to reintegrate into its consciousness, I guess you could use those terms. Sure. Language starts to fail when you get into this realm. But anyway, if, if that integration process is interfered with, and if it's frightened, for one thing, if you're given a stigmatizing label, mm -hmm. or if you're isolated, you know, the brain is a social organ. It needs, it's, it wants company. It wants um, relationship. If you stigmatize, isolate the person, and then drug them, um, you know, it's a very dangerous combination. I think so, too. And, and w let me just add a, a kind of... Uh like little uh, note that uh, I'm not saying, or I don't think that you are either, that there's no place for antipsychotics or conventional psychiatric medication, that there's a time and a place for them. But the kind of uh, uh, overarching, just mindless use of them to quell what we don't like to see or what makes us uncomfortable just because it makes us uncomfortable, uh, I don't know about that. You know what I mean? And I, I think that to, to skillfully really understand the depth and context of what is being expressed in an individual and then skillfully administering with, with a kind of uh, great care that it, it, maybe it will be for a lifetime, but it may not be. And so often I see, I see a situation where people are, they have this in, in, in Western culture, uh, a, a psychosis, a psychotic break. And, uh, you know, certain people are like, they're done. You know, you are done. You are done. And what they mean by that is really that you are done with convention. And you are done uh, in, in the sense of like you are going to be on medication forever. And I found that uh, through my own exploration of my own medication uh, and conjunctional uh, support that uh, it, is an, it is an ever changing, evolving and uh, kind of uh, interesting uh aspect or characteristic of myself that, um, and, it, and it, it doesn't come without great danger. It does. I mean, I have to be very cautious and very careful, but it doesn't mean that I just wholeheartedly hands off, do not explore that. This is my body, my life, my psyche, my experience. And I think that I'm in charge of my uh, condition and my experience. So therefore, with the help of professionals who really care, uh, that, that that's something to be explored because it's an ever-evolving, ever-changing thing, you know, so... That's right. No, I, I echo what you just said, Joel. Um, medications have done a lot of good for a lot of people. They certainly have for me, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it isn't, you know, if you're in that very, um, if, if you've gotten to a very manic or um, you can't sleep at night, uh, which often happens, they're very good for calming down those initial per periods. The thing that I have against the medications at this point, after interviewing all these people we've interviewed, um, is that they're being way overused. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's like uh, we are not only biological beings, but we all also are social we have our psychology, and we have a spirituality. So the thing with the biomedical approach, which has essentially dominated the treatment in our culture, it has muscled out the psychosocial um, aspects of treatment and the spiritual aspects. So that's my, um, that's my problem with the, the, the medications that they're being way overused. And, you know, it's really frightening at the rate they're being used in kids. You know, ADHD is this huge, you know, catch-all 
for a, a variety of symptoms of a, a child that that may be bored in school, who knows what. But six million kids labeled ADHD. A New York Times article came out a couple of months ago saying 10,000 toddlers, two to three year olds, are now on um, ADHD medication, which is speed, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just gotten out of hand. And that's. Uh, <laughs> We, you know, if you look at the growth in medication, um, just in sales in the last 20 to 25 years, it's increased 80 fold. And the interesting thing is during that same period of time, the people going on medic, um, SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance for mental issues has um, gone up fourfold. Mm. So why, if we're if these medications are completely doing their job, why aren't the number of mentally disabled going down? That that, that we have to ask ourselves. Um, so yes, in the short term, acute handling of conditions. Sometimes in long term, in certain individuals. But to give somebody, when you first diagnose them, a diagnosis of no hope, that you're going to be on, there's nothing you can do, your brain is diseased, you'll be on these for the rest of your life. Um, I'm hearing a lot of people say that they were told that. And that, yeah, so that really, and, you know, so that's, that's what I have against this. So trying to come up with solutions, but it can get out of hand. Yeah. Um, you know, the corporations have one mandate, and that's the bottom line. Yeah. It's to serve their shareholders, and that's it. Yeah, and it's interesting. I just, when you were speaking, Phil, I thought for a minute about uh, this issue that uh, really we trade, uh, we trade uh, the treatment of say psychosis we trade the human interaction support teaching and mentoring for a pill and i just there's something really wrong with that in in my estimation and not that the pill needs to be discarded or neglected but in conjunction i think it'd be a a much more powerful approach you know and and part of the difficulty of that but the party part of the difficulty of that is like really do we have enough people who are who are uh, capable of providing that support, you know, and and how do we find that? How do we increase that? How do we, how do we, how do we gain uh, uh, significance for for people in in society to to want to address the needs of others, especially those who, in certain cultures, are considered healers, leaders, gifted, you know? What are we doing with with those people, you know? Well, I think as People learn that there are other effective ways of handling this, and um, and there are. And we found a great program up in northern Finland called Open Dialogue. In this little town way up near the Arctic Circle, a town called Torino, a population of about 70,000. And it might have been because it was up near the Arctic Circle where it's dark most of the winter. <laughs> But they had the highest level of schizophrenia in Europe uh, 25 years ago. And they started this program called Open Dialogue. And it was a, a kind of a revolutionary way they handled these first break psychoses. And today, they have the lowest level of schizophrenia oh. in all of Europe. Oh, oh, oh. So they are obviously doing something right. And You know, when uh, we were talking with them, and I haven't gone up there yet, but I've talked to the woman here in in the United States who is bringing open dialogue to the United States, Um, their methodology. She uh, was telling us, uh, so when somebody has a break, they don't send the person to the hospital. The team goes to the person's house. That's number one. They keep the person in their familiar surroundings with their social network, with their family, 
They encourage their lovers to be there, their wives, their spouses, whatever. Um, they um, want their employers there if they're working. And they conduct this thing called open dialogue. And what the, so first of all, they don't isolate the person. They're not sent to an emergency room. So many people are sent to an emergency room when this happens. And in an emergency room, you're second on, you know, in terms of importance. If there's a car crash victim that comes in or a heart attack or a shooting, they're going to be service first. And you may be strapped down even in the back room for hours or days. And so that's the worst thing for somebody in this state that's, you know, panic because they're leaving consensus reality. Um, so they don't let that happen. They go to the person's house. That's number one. And then this open dialogue, they're not there to make a diagnosis. You know, the whole thing about diagnosis is we have this manual. It's called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Diseases. And people are starting to react to this, this book. Um, it, it was first published in 1955, uh, and the, the fifth edition just came out a couple of months ago. The number of disorders, mental disorders, has grown. <laughs> this was a 200-page book when it first was published. It's now over 1,000 pages. A lot of people say that that diagnostic and statistical manual is just an excuse for not listening. Mm. So you can go into a doctor, uh, a psychiatrist, and sometimes, I'm not saying this always happens, but maybe they only have an hour to see you, to talk to you about They'll go down and you'll list your, they'll ask six or seven questions of criteria. And if you meet the criteria of a certain diagnosis, yep, you're bipolar, or yep, you're schizoaffective, or you're depressed, or you're severely anxiety. Um, I said all that just to say, in Finland, they go in, they don't want to do a diagnosis. They don't want to put you in a pigeonhole. They want to listen. What is your experience? What's happening? What are you experiencing? They, and they don't judge that experience. You may say, you know, I'm seeing Martians in the room. They don't judge it. They don't say you're nuts, you're crazy, you, 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 there's no Martians in the room. They go with whatever, whatever it is. So that's one thing. They call it, they drop the clinical gaze. Uh, yeah, powerful. And, and they say that's extremely powerful, very transparent. They don't, they don't do any backdoor discussions. Everything takes place right in front of the mm. individual. So right, not because going to what, the back room and saying, "Okay, he looks, he looks uh, like he's schizophrenic to me." What do you think, Joe? No, all of that stuff happens right with the family, right with everything. So they're totally transparent. If I could just interject for a second, yeah, because really, if you're having a psychotic break. Oftentimes, that's accompanied by paranoia. You have people go out in the other room talking about you, you know, uh, then your paranoia may be justified. You know? Yeah. And the, the, um, the people, the, the staff that have come to the person's home, usually it, they have a peer-to-peer -peer person. That's somebody that's been through one of these breaks and has managed to... Um, survive it. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say survive it, but manage to become completely functional again and knows what it was and how to handle it. So there's a peer-to-peer -peer person, much like the shaman that is given to um, a young person having a break in an indigenous community. So there's a mentor like that. And the other thing about it, these, so there could be a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and one of these peer-to-peer -peer people, and they um, discuss right there with everybody. It's completely transparent. They may be arguing about the treatment. They may be saying, well, I don't know. I, I, my feeling that should, we should do this, or my feeling we should do that, and somebody said, well, I'm, this is why I'm thinking. They're, they're talking about it with everybody. There's no, it's, as I say, complete transparency. So it's, it's, it's fairly unique. They work in a team. They're at the person's 
in the own the person's own environment. So they get a lot of success with that. And it's something we can learn from. But there's obstacles. <laughs> and the obstacles are insurance. It, uh, insurance uh, doesn't um, ask or doesn't allow people to work in teams. That's what I've been told anyway. Um, and I still need to learn more about that. But the way the insurance is set up, the way our whole system is set up, mm -hmm. it's more for a one-on-one. -on -one. It's more for quick visits. We've interviewed, you know, a lot of people that are that have been in the trenches for 30 years in public um, health that handle these people coming in and say, you know, we used to back in um, the late 70s, early 80s, have a caseload of about 12 where we could really spend some time with these people. He says our caseload now is up to 60 to 70. And not only that, we have to fill out all this paperwork. And he says the paperwork is so daunting that you end up having to um, fabricate some of the answers um, just to keep your funding. And so he says even the auditors that come in, they know you're fabricating because they had to fabricate before because usually the auditors are ex-psychologists that have moved on to auditing. Underfunded um, um, system uh, that, that really doesn't allow some very common sense things from taking place. Yeah, so what I hear, the underlying thing that I hear you expressing, Phil, is, is uh, in, in our culture, in Western culture, the economics clashing with really our humanity and our treatment of those individuals who are, you know, I'll say it again, as you've taught me, uh, are gifted healers, leaders, potentially, in a community. And so it's the economics that really are driving the treatment of things. So what, 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 it boils down to the question, what are we valuing? What do we value? You know, what are we valuing? Well, here's the, here's the kicker, Joel. It really isn't economics if you look at the long term. In the short term, yeah. yes. But if you look at the long term, 56% of the people in prison are, have a mental illness of some sort. 25% of the homeless do. A person in prison costs the taxpayers between $300 and $400 a day, right? Um, a person who goes on SSDI, and by the way, 1,100 people go on SSDI for mental illness every day, 250 to 300 are children right mm. now. Think of that. But every, especially a child that goes on. But say you go on when you're 20 years old, typically if you go on SSDI for mental health issues, you're going to stay on for the rest of your life. That's pretty much what it is. And... Every person on SSDI over a lifetime in today's dollars will cost us a million dollars. So every day we're committing ourselves to $1.1 billion yeah. of, of long-term treatment uh, and add up everybody in prison and, and then think about kids going on. Yeah. Then it's about a million and a half over a lifetime. So... You know, in terms of costs, it seems like if we had to increase these um, short-term costs, that yeah, it would be exp more expensive in the short run. But in the long run, it's going to save not only the productivity that these people represent, but save just hard dollars. Sure, yeah, I know. That I feel, too, is really, what about the honoring of just that experience, too? You know, and that's that's that's... Well, that's all, of it to, all of it together is just, it seems like a no-brainer. It seems so clear, you know, what, what direction we would want to take, you know. Yeah, and that's the other side. You hit on it. Yeah. These people are gifted. <laughs> they have, <laughs> you know, uh, I, unlike you, I've not gone through this, and I, I, and I don't have your gift. Uh, the gifts that these people have in their sensitivities. <laughs> It can be used, in, and, and this gets into the spiritual aspects of it. Um, we're going down to Brazil where um, it's a much spirituality is looked at very differently down there um, in that uh, 
there's 50 psychiatric hospitals down there that use mediums, mm. much like the Nechung Oracle yeah. channels. They use mediums in their treatment. They also, right alongside the psychiatrist that can prescribe meds, the psychologist that can um, do the talk therapy, and the family therapist, they have mediums. And so that's part of the, the equation, and they're finding... I, I'm going down there in October to document it, but what I hear is they're finding that that works very well for them. Yeah. And uh, whether it can translate into the belief system of our culture is, is another thing, but we're talking to a lot of people that uh, go back and forth, and now there, there are 70 of these centers here in the U.S., these spiritist centers. So, um, you know, it's... It, 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 I think it's a very important part of the human psyche, and it's an important part that needs to be addressed. I couldn't agree with you more, and it's really interesting, Phil, because I can hear the naysayers like uh, mediums. <laughs> Uh, yeah. How 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 are you going to pan that? How are we going to scientifically prove that somebody's an actual authentic medium? <laughs> you know what I mean. You know you know what I'm saying. Like it's I can hear it already, and um, you know I think I think that gift, like anything, you will get. It's a bell curve, probably in a sense, or maybe not even. But there'll be a percentage who can, a percentage who maybe sort of can, and a percentage who can't. And I don't know what how that plays out. But uh, people want to know, how, how do we discern what is authentic from what is not, especially in this very uh, kind of cynical uh, uh, culture, you know, society? Because, and it, it, it stands to reason, actually, if you look at the larger context about spirituality and what is spirituality, what is spirituality to us in the West? You know, we haven't, uh, we haven't done justice to, to uh, kind of explore or convey what is spirituality and really where does spirituality uh, exist if not within our own hearts and minds. Beyond that, the Zen master Dogen, who was a 13th century Zen master, I think he brought uh, uh, from one country to another, he brought the, the transmission of Zen. And uh, he said uh, something to the effect, I'll paraphrase, that if you cannot find the truth right where you are, where do you expect to find it? Yeah. And and so, uh, really, it's it's our disconnection with ourself that we don't understand the gift that we are resting in right now, that this, the cultivation of the appreciation of what is ordinary, you know, what is right before us, you know, isn't that the gift, this body the gift? Like, where does this come from? Do we know? If we don't, then what is it? You know, why don't we explore that question? I find it very interesting. And as you were talking, and you are talking about uh, mediums, which is riddled throughout Unraveling Religions conversations, is The Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson, who just passed uh, a little while ago. Oh, and, I didn't know he had. Yeah, he just, he oh. just uh, I think, uh, right as his n n latest book had come out. But wow. such a gifted uh, uh, writer and, and yeah. human being. But in, in The Snow Leopard, there's a quote that I, I may have read before on Unraveling Religion, but it totally, you, you were speaking, and it just, I pulled it up on the internet. I have the computer in front of me, and if I could just read it for a second, maybe we can talk about this. It's a, a Roka quote, and it says, That is at bottom the only courage that is demanded of, demanded of us, to have courage for the most strange, the most singular, and the most inexplicable that we may encounter. It has in this sense been cowardly, he has done life endless harm. The experiences that are so-called visions, the whole so-called spirit world, death, all those things that are so closely akin to us have been daily parried, been so crowded out of life that the senses to which we have grasped them have atrophied, to say nothing of God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's so true. And, you know, when I try it, you ask, well, what is spirituality? Yeah. So I used to, I mean, one definition I use is in terms of is a person spiritual or not? Or where do they lie on the spiritual spectrum, so to speak? I think at one end is where you look at yourself as completely as a separate you know, you're in this bag of skin and you're separate from the rest of the world and you've been thrown into this world and, you know, it's kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog and just you have to survive. And that feeling of 
isolation and separateness is at one end. The other end is where you feel unified to everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you, it's, if somebody explained it as you're a fish made out of water in water. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but so, you know, like Adam and so many of the people we've talked to, when they have this first break, they describe it as blissful. Mm. When it first hits, that he said, this was the first time I had this feeling of I was I was it and it was me. I mean, there was no separation between him and other people, between him and the environment, between the between nature and them. And so he had this feeling of unity. To me, that's being spiritual. Yeah. That's the goal of any spiritual practice is is. And of course, as you go along that that gradient or that continuum, your compassion grows and grows because you become other things. So um, you identify with them more and more, and of course, you're compassionate towards it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you use the word self. That that's a very loaded word. Is it? Uh, is it that isolated being at that one end, or is it? the all that is at the other yeah. you know what, what what do you mean when you say the self that expansion and consciousness of what the self is we're, we're all trying to expand in in our spiritual journey hmm. yeah so interesting and uh yeah that expansion also ties into um karma which is not not a law it's just an affirmation of the unity of all existence that how I entreat what is outside of me comes back to me. How could it be another way? Yeah, so, you know, this project for me is a very interesting one because it goes to the root of consciousness, really. Yeah, yeah. You know, what what is consciousness? And when we interviewed Stan Groff, Stanislav Groff, who is a transpersonal psychologist, much out of the Jungian, Carl Jungian tradition, yeah. he said... To think that the brain is where consciousness comes from, the, the brain produces consciousness, uh, is to think like, so if you have a TV set, you want, the programming on it isn't what you want. You don't want to watch the evening news. You want to, you want to watch um, Netflix or something else. <laughs> well, if you call... TV repairman to come over there and change the tubes and the resistors and whatsoever, you know, or, or say you you want the evening news to be more positive or, or more frightening or whatever. You call the TV repairman to work on the resistors and everything to make that programming more of what you want it to be. He, he says that's what you're doing if you're looking at the brain and trying to put the chemicals in the brain to make its consciousness change. Right. Consciousness is, call it the great spirit, call it God, call it what you will, is... Um, the brain interprets it. It 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 it, it, it isn't. Um, it it's created by consciousness. The brain, the body, everything is created by consciousness. Mm. That's that's the way he put it, anyway. Yeah. So it you know it kind of resonated with me. I have to stop and think about it a bit. Yeah, but that and of course you start talking in those realms. It we haven't got the language that really can do it justice and it becomes very abstract and but that's why the Dalai Lama comes out and says you know my religion is simple I just practice kindness yeah. <laughs> that's my spiritual journey and by the way um, part of our movie we're interviewing I'm gonna go this October and interview the um, Oracle that started me on this journey he's now oh, yeah. two years old Okay, this culture uh, talking about mediums, you know, what? what? What's this deal with mediums? Uh, uh, what value is there? Well, one of the ways in the, so me as a filmmaker, I've got to somehow make it relatable or put some sort of stamp of approval on it. So I know that the Dalai Lama has come out and said, 
you know, you in the West may think this is strange, but we actually get valuable information out of the Ne Chung Oracle, out of this, the Kutin, the medium. And so that's one way we're doing it is, you know, the stamp of approval of the Dalai Lama, who's highly respected in our culture now um, in the West is one way. Um, the other way is re really going to go down to Brazil and interview these professors who are in their universities who have studied with professors up here at Duke and the University of Pennsylvania, because there's now starting to be departments of spirituality and health, spirituality and health um, departments. So that'll be another way. And it was just, boy, uh, it was more than that. It was that they... Conveying about Crazy Wise, uh, anything at all? Is there anything you want to say about it? Or oh, Yeah, I mean, we're 75% through the production. I still have, to, still have to do some more investigation, like we're going down to Brazil. We may be going to New Zealand, where um, there's a shamanic tradition down there that's being used in a very effective way. But especially up to northern Finland, where open dialogue is. And um, what I want Crazy Wise to do is to really start a conversation. Not that it isn't already started, but I want to be a part of the movement that is now growing to say, yes, there are alternatives to the biomedical approach. And these alternatives aren't to replace the biomedical approach. It's to augment it. Right. It's to balance it. Sure. We're way out of balance now. Yeah, that isn't going to be my message because I'm, I'm not going to be in this documentary staying, saying what should be or shouldn't be. I, we're just going to present, you know, things we found that where they, they, they find certain methodologies are working. And so we can start talking about them and start talking, what would it take to try them here? Mm -hmm. My job is to produce a film that's compelling, grabs people, and, and makes them stop and think about the current set of circumstances.